So I served in the Marine Corps from November of 1977 to November of 1981. The most significant event that happened during my service was the Iran hostage crisis. Um, I was in the air wing. I was a 53 mechanic. And I was with HMH 461 stationed at uh, New River Air Station, North Carolina, which is south of Camp Lejeune. So, wasn't long after the hostages were taken, um, we started losing helicopters. We would send a crew out on a mission, and they wouldn't come back. So, we, we nicknamed it the Puth Mission because we knew it didn't take a rocket scientist to figure out why they were disappearing. We didn't know where they were going. So I was a Lance Corporal, soon to be Corporal at that time. I may have just made Corporal. Did I make, yeah, I made Corporal in November of 80. No, it was after, after this. So I was a Lance Corporal. Um, we were getting ready for a NATO cruise. So before you go on the cruise, you go, you take uh, cold weather training. So that this particular time, we uh, flew three 53s, three 53 helicopters like you see in the picture here, out to Fallon, Nevada. Fallon, Nevada was gonna be our base of operations. So they broke us. Uh, down into three groups that would go up into the Sierra Nevadas for cold weather training. So I got placed in the first group. So they took us in a bus. I mean, this is a school bus from Fallon, Nevada to Pickle Meadows, California. We went through Carson City, Nevada. We went around Tahoe. So it's not far from Tahoe. But it's, they call it the Marine Corps Warfare, Marine Corps Mountain Warfare now. It's a pretty big deal now. It was just getting started up, I think, at that time. They've got nice facilities and all out there now. So when we got to Pickle Meadows, a troop transport, probably from the Korean War or sometime, it was old. It was so old that the back gate wouldn't close, and it had a cover over it. And there was a gap where the cover didn't meet the gate. Dust was billowing in to the back where we were at, and it was it almost suffocated us. And I'm not joking, peeps. Uh, I thought we were going to die before we stopped. So we finally stopped. I got out, and I looked. And there was a shack. I mean, a shack. It had had siding, had flooring, but it had gaps between all the wood. So I knew it was gonna be a cold night. But I learned an important lesson that night. You don't sleep on a cot in cold weather because the cold air blows under the cot and it, frees you, it freezes your backside off. So we spent the night in the, in the shack and then we went on up the mountain and there was three civilian instructors that met us up there. They taught us about hypothermia, first aid for cold weather injuries, and uh, uh, you know things like that. Um, and the whole time we were up there, we didn't see any 53s. We had flown out there with three 53s and three 46s. Uh, the 46s were from HMM 263, um, and they were another squadron that were going to join us on the NATO cruise. So the 46s are, we call them the frog, uh, affectionately, of course. Uh, it's the tandem rotor heads. It's kind of like a 47 Chinook, but it's smaller. Marine Corps version. And uh, the only support we got was from the 46s. And the 46 guys, man, they were giving us a hard time. Our helicopters had gone down because we had conducted phase inspections. We had to do that when we got to Fallon, Nevada. It's kind of like getting oil changed. Every 3,000 miles, 
you get you get your oil changed. Well, after so many hours of flying, you would conduct uh, a phase inspection. I think there was three. There was an A, a B, and a C. Well, all three helicopters went down because of marginal parts discovered or bad during the phase inspections. So, yep, the 46 guys, they were rubbing it in, but on the last day, on the last day, I heard it coming. The, the sound of a 53 is distinct like a Harley. That thing come through the valley. We were midway up the mountainside. The helicopter came below us in the valley. You could see it, and it was screaming through the valley. When it got to the end, it banked up, and the bank was so hard the bra the blades were popping, pop, 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 pop. Uh, that it come around and landed not too far from our camp. So everybody was getting ready to leave. We all had our sea bags packed, cold weather gear and all that stuff. And uh, I'm walking to the helicopter and I hit a snow drift. I dropped into a hole about five feet deep. It was up to my neck. I looked up and the helicopter, the pilots were laughing their butts off. So I climbed out of that hole with my sea bag, finally got into 53. And uh, so I mentioned we took a bus and a troop transport on the way up there. Well, on the back, we flew into 53, and it was some of the prettiest country I've ever seen out there in the Sierra Nevadas. Really, it was breathtaking. I always told myself I'd go back. So we flew back to Fallon, Nevada, our base, opera, base of operations, and we, they told us we had to fly to Santa Ana Marine Corps Air Station, Santa Ana in California, just south of Los Angeles, to get some parts to get our other two helicopters up and flying. Because what they had done, they had cannibalized off the two helicopters to get one helicopter ready for flight. And that's the one that picked us up. So we flew it to Santa Ana, and they called it Tustin uh, Air, Marine Corps Air Station, but I always refer to it as Santa Ana, because uh, that's what it was when I, when I was stationed out there for a little while. Um, so we landed in Santa Ana, went to maintenance control, got our parts, and uh, we were in a van that was going to take us back out to the helicopter. And I saw Major Hutton, who was a pilot, was talking to what I call a full bird colonel, a Marine Corps colonel. And I couldn't tell what they were saying, but when Major Hutton got in the van, he said, we've got to fly to Yuma, Arizona. And I'm thinking, poof, you know, we're gone. And that was okay with me. Uh, I would have been fine with that. But um, we flew. We didn't go back to Fallon. We flew straight to Yuma, Arizona, Marine Corps Air Station, Yuma, Arizona. And we landed, we parked, and after a few minutes, after we shut down, I looked and you could see a 53 in the horizon coming to the airfield. And then what long after that, you could hear it. So when they landed, they didn't land on the runway. They landed directly behind us. And um, they landed, shut down, all the crew and the pilots got off the helicopter, but they kept their visors down, the dark visors, because they didn't want to be recognized. This is a top secret mission. So um, they came over to us and said, y'all got five minutes to get your stuff off the helicopter. We're taking it. And they did. Five minutes, they were turning the helicopter up and they were gone. And they left us with a piece of junk. They had flew the crap out of this 53 out in the desert. So we pre-flighted the bird and uh, took off to go back to Fallon. Well, as soon as Major Hutton lifted off and we got a little bit of altitude, that helicopter started vibrating. It started shaking. The teeth in my head were rattling. It was shaking so bad. So Major Hutton turned it around, went back to Yuma. And when he parked, we, um, we got up on the helicopter uh, to see what was going on and we found six bad uh, blade dampers 
there's six blades on the rotor head of a 53 and those blade dampers hold the blade out in the lead position when it's turning so very important part uh, it took us a few days we got the parts and get them replaced but we got we got the dampers replaced and we flew back to Fallon once we got back to Fallon it was time to go back to New River North Carolina so we flew cross country uh, back to New River in the 53's and we left to go on the NATO cruise uh, January February uh, it was the maiden voyage of the USS Saipan and the USS Saipan is a LHA landing helicopter assault and it's like an aircraft carrier but it's shorter and it's for helicopters um, and they have Marines they have infantry Marines on board it's a combat unit on that ship you got transportation and you got Marines with guns uh, and we would fly the Marines in uh, you know to wherever they were needed so when we got to uh, uh, Tromso, Norway which is 150 miles inside the Arctic Circle we went into a fjord and man talk about beautiful you've seen pictures of fjords in geography and school and all well those pictures don't do it justice but while we were there uh, we were inland based for a week in the, you know on the, the shore of the fjord and uh, when it was time to go back you know we got back to the ship and it was time to take a shower so we were stinking you know uh, and the hot water system had something had happened to it they didn't have hot water we had to take cold I mean cold showers but I had to take one uh, we still hadn't heard back from my guys you know we knew where they were out there training but as far as exactly if they were still out there or what was going we didn't know we got back to New River uh, it was a three month cruise got back to New River it was in April sometime I think uh, you guys that served with me you know when it was I can't remember the exact dates but um, still hadn't heard and then on 25 April 1980 they mustered us they got us in formation and they told us that three of our brothers have been killed in an accident over at Desert One in Iran and that was devastating um, if you're in the military if you were in the military and you lose a brother a sister a friend it's very impactful uh, because you're close and just like losing a family member uh, so when that happened uh, you know we were fired up we were ready we were ready to go to Iran we were getting our part we were getting parts together we were getting equipment we were getting our gear packing ready to go to Iran and, uh, and which was the most devastating part for me was when Jimmy Carter said we couldn't go because we were ready and uh, we didn't get our opportunity but every year at this time I think about uh, Dewey Johnson George Holmes and John Harvey three great Marines and even better men that will always be missed and will never be forgotten R.I.P. Dewey, George, and John.